Hello, folks. This is Dave Meinhardt in Detroit the Batacuti Foundation. I really appreciate seeing so many people that have registered for this webinar today. Dr. Tawari hails from New York City, where he's chairman of the Milton and Carol Petrie Department of Urology at the Icon School of Medicine at the Mount Sinai Health System. He is a world-renowned urologist and prostate cancer specialist. As director of the Department of Urology, he leads a multidisciplinary team committed to improving prostate cancer treatment, research, and education. To date, he has performed over 5,000 radical prostatectomy surgeries. In 2012, he was awarded the American Urological Association's Gold Cystoscope Award. Dr. Tuari holds several leadership positions domestically and internationally. Among his several fellowships and residency posts, he spent time in Detroit at the Batacuti Urology Institute at Henry Ford Hospital, working under Dr. Monty Menon as part of the team that performed the first robotic radical prostatectomy in the United States nearly 15 years ago. Dr. Tawari has authored over 250 peer-reviewed articles, book chapters, and textbooks on prostate cancer and robotic surgery. We would like to thank him for joining us today. And Dr. Tawari, I apologize for the technical difficulties we're having here in Detroit. I ask you to please go ahead, sir. Thanks again. Welcome to this uh, webinar. And uh, it's a privilege to be part of this uh, educational opportunity, which uh, comes from a department where I am part of uh, from the very beginning. And uh, Mr. Vatikuti, who is a major philanthropist, was instrumental in starting the robotic revolution, who helped Dr. Menon in establishing a program, and I happened to be at the right place at the right time. Since then, I've had a journey, and then now I'm in New York City. A little bit about my background. Uh, I uh, started as in just a an, uh, urological surgeon, got involved with uh, prostate cancer. And uh, during that journey, I learned that just being a surgeon was not sufficient to take care of patients who sometimes needed uh, a second and a third round of battle. So this is my experience with the transition from a surgeon to a researcher while maintaining a busy surgical practice. What is happening right now is that uh, there is a significant growth in understanding of the genomics of different cancers and also of prostate cancer. Genomic essentially has changed the way we look at different diseases, look at different cancers, look at vaccines, look at targeted therapies, and look at diagnosing prostate cancer. And what it entailed has a background, and I want to share that background with you. This is part of the excerpts from the talk which I recently gave at Oxford University looking at the genomics of prostate cancer. As with any work, uh, there are a lot of people who are involved in actually making things work, and I have been lucky to have a team of amazing individuals, the PhDs, scientists, researchers, fellows, and different medical students who have been working with me. I've also been lucky with the different collaborators at Cold Spring Harbor, Wild Cornell, and different departments in Mount Sinai. You can see the list here. I've been funded uh, through National Cancer Institute. I've been funded uh, through Prostate Cancer Foundation and the Global Prostate Cancer Foundation. Different other people have funded me in this research activity. I tend to simplify things. And when I look at prostate cancer, I think there are three different kinds of prostate cancers. One which is just like small cups, pretty innocent, not necessarily are going to do a major damage. And in the scientific term, we call them Gleason 6 prostate cancer. But then there are a little bit more aggressive cancers. They are the Gleason 7 prostate cancers. And if you look closely at this tiger's mouth, this is a toothless tiger. If we can manage it appropriately and we can really differentiate it from the bad guys, this is not that bad a cancer. But then, every now and then, we see a one which is a lethal prostate cancer. This differentiation between the indolent, between aggressive, and between very aggressive is the key factor in our understanding of prostate cancer and how we manage it and how we go on to tackle this in terms of the treatment, follow-up, and the future therapies. 
this is an example of one of the cancers which actually was lethal and ended up taking life in a case. This is an aggressive Gleason 9 patient who had a cancer spreading to most of the parts of the body. And this is a reminder for me and for my colleagues that we have to continue fighting this battle so that we can win at the end of the day so no one has to go through having this kind of cancer in their body. When you look at prostate cancer, it actually is a start of in one cell dividing and multiplying multiple times. You're looking inside the prostate. One of the cell is duplicating. It finally is invading into the surrounding cells and it is becoming what we call a Gleason 7 cancer. Up to this point, it is very curable. Up to this point, this cancer can be tackled just by radiation or surgery. But when it goes out, when it surrounds around the nerves, when it goes through the blood vessels, this is a cancer which is becoming one of those man -eaters. We need to find cancers before they become like this, before they go to the bone and they spread in the rest of the body. And that is the challenge which we are facing at this point, how to differentiate indolent from an aggressive prostate cancer and what is the best strategy to handle more aggressive cancers so that we have a multimodality plan in place when we deal with them. So I wanted to understand genomics so that I can provide a better care to my patients. And the first step in that was to understand the genomics as such. So understanding genomic is like going back to the medical school again. I again simplified the process and what do I understood? The genomic is essentially a whole DNA content of our body but organized in a very structured manner. Just, just imagine. Imagine we have two cookbooks. One from the parental side and one from the maternal side. And these two sets of books have 23 chapters written in each one of them. Each one of them is the genome and these 23 chapters are actually the chromosomes which we have. Each one of this chapter, each one of this chromosome has paragraphs which describe some skill. And each one of that paragraph can actually be simplified as a gene. And these genes, they are the recipe for one or the other action. And genes ultimately work through coding a protein. And that coding happens from DNA to RNA to actual transcription. So simplified version is here that each one of these paragraphs is a gene. And these are arranged in the chromosome. And these chromosomes are long in length, and I'll come to that in the next one. If you have to imagine how much of a DNA we have in each one of them, we have enough DNA in each one of us that if we unfold it, we have enough length for us to go from planet Earth to Sun, and not just one time, 300 times. So that entire long length of DNA, I mean very microscopic amount, is coded, folded, packaged in a very precise way that we carry that in each one of them, that DNA and the genome. So if you look through the DNA, it's a simplified version. There are chromosomes, there are genes, there is a surrounding protein, there is in packaging areas, there are histosomes, nucleosomes and all those which we can directly go into the molecular biology book and study it. But it was fun to know that how much of a DNA each one of us have. Then came a new terminology that we had to understand. And the new terminology comes that we are taught as a medical students how to study the EKGs and we can look at the CAT scans and we can look at an MRI. And now we have to look at whole genome sequencing which actually measures the whole DNA sequence as to what is happening. Or you can just look at those which are being transcribed and that is known as an exome sequencing. So those two terms needed to be understood by a surgeon 
just to understand the basic biology of prostate cancer. Or you can don't, you can decide not to worry about the DNA part of it, rather focus on the RNA which is transcribed from the DNA, then you can do a drug RNA sequencing or just look at very small RNAs which are also present in the transcription process. And that's known as a small RNA sequencing. But sometimes you don't have to look only on the DNA and RNA. So not just the exome sequencing and a small RNA sequencing, you can actually look at the histones, how the packaging is happening, and the chromatin protein, and that is known as a chip sequencing. And then ultimately there is in something known as epigenomics in which lifestyle factors, diet, environment, fat, inflammation can actually impact how DNA is being transcribed. Not that we were born with a particular imbalance, but the imbalance happened because the way our DNA got expressed. And that expression profiling is also known as epigenomics. And this all is possible because of the technology development, which is known as the next, ge next generation sequencers. And all the cells of our body can be sequenced. And now we are working on strategies that even a single cell of our body, we can enhance, multiply, amplify the DNA, and get the understanding of the entire genome. This technology needed to be understood. This terminology needed to be understood. But then we also needed to understand what are we trying to find in our genome. Different terms, at least we need to be familiar with, and the mutational profile, mutational spectrum, mutational rate, RNA expression, pathway analysis, the structural variations, copy number variations. Are the chromosomes balanced? Are there differences between the chromosomes in the different areas of the cancer? This all needed to be understood. At least we had to familiarize ourselves. This field is evolving at a very rapid pace. Then I needed to understand what does it means to have a mutation? Mutation basically is that once we read those cookbooks, if we don't take care of a book very well, mold develops. If there is in some kind of a smudging which is happening, let us don't appear clear. We misread them. And that misreading involves mutations because when we read and retype it, we make mistakes. Like look at an example here, there is an alphabet missing altogether and everything will be moving in left or a right. So this is known as the frame shift mutation. Or sometimes you see all the alphabets are jumbled together in which a small segment of the chromosome is missing or twisted. These are the different ways the DNA may have a problem and the message is misprint. In a generic way, we call it mutations. The next thing I needed to understand, after knowing enough about the technology, enough about the language of uh, genomics, I needed to understand what is happening inside the cancer cells. I'm not just saying about prostate cancer, but I'm saying what was happening inside a cancer cell. Why suddenly a cell of our own starts misbehaving instead of living in an harmony with the other cells in the neighborhood in the same organ, it decides to outperform everyone else. Not only it is outperforming in terms of how it handles the energy, how it steals the blood away from the neighboring cells, but it multiplies. Sometimes it multiplies at the cost of the nourishments and the space of the other cells which are around. And that is how cancer does its own damage. And then comes the time when the cancer cells start spreading around. So, Certain terms need to be understood, and one of them that there is in sustained proliferative signaling. Cancer cells have an addiction in terms of knowing that I need to multiply, multiply, multiply. And that normally is in control for the normal cells. Obviously, we all grew from two cells merging into one and then dividing and becoming millions and trillions of cells. But there was some controls and balances which allowed us to reach to a certain number, certain critical number, and then stop multiplying. That critical number concept, that living in harmony with the other cells concept, somehow got disappeared in these cancer cells. And they are either overactive or they have figured out a mechanism in which they bypass 
everything else which is there to control them. And that essentially the second thing that evading the growth suppressors. Normally we do have growth suppressors. This all clumped together is in classical hallmarks of the cancer. And I needed to understand as a surgeon, so what I did was to imagine myself that I am driving a car. And that car happens to be a cancer cell. Imagine a car in which you suddenly take your foot off the accelerator. But guess what? The car still keeps going at an 80 miles in speed. That essentially is a phenomena of what is happening in a cancer cell that the normal proliferative mechanism is in hyperdrive. What is happening? We call them in oncogenes. There are certain oncogenes like they keep giving a signal to the cell that they need to grow, divide, grow, divide. Okay, so car's accelerator is stuck. The next thing which I would do is to put some brakes on. Normal cells do have brakes. We call them tumor suppressors. But in the cancer cells, something happens that even those brakes, they don't work. And when they are not working, we have a stuck accelerator with the non-functioning brakes. So then we hope that sooner or later this car will run out of the gas and this cell will stop dividing. And that's actually what happens in terms of the telomerase chain, which normal cells have an, a message encrypted at the end of the DNA, which tells us how many times you can divide. Cancer cells have a mechanism in which they figure out how to overcome that handicap. And they have an unlimited supply that they will keep dividing till we do something about it. What happens next? That not only this car is running very fast without any brakes and it's not likely to stop, it manages its gas and the carburetor in a much better way because cancer cells have a different metabolic pathway. They can handle energy much more efficiently than every other cell. Cancer cells are not worried about the looks. Cancer cells are not worried about the functionality. Only reason for their sustenance at this point is to manage energy in a way so that they can divide, divide, and spread. So there is a deregulation of the cellular energetics which is built for the speed. And then normally something like this happens. You hope that a cop will stop your car. And that normally happens in a real life. Because if you see a cell misbehaving, the body's own defense mechanism comes and puts a clamp on it. The body's white cells, the macrophages, the Kupfer cells, and other cells, they can control all that. But that doesn't happen in cancer cells because cancer cells mask the antigen, which are normally an enticing or inciting factors for starting that process. So there is a suppression of the body's own immune launch against these cells. Up to this point, this car is crazy enough that it's running on the road and you are worried. But some point, this car becomes what we call an all-terrain vehicle. Essentially what happens that now this cell, which was supposed to be stationary in one area, is dividing uncontrolled and it can actually move. And that movement is what leads to an invasion, an invasion is what leads to spread, and a spread is what leads to metastasis, and that ultimately is the way cancer cells damage the whole body. So I needed to understand all that, simplify it, and then put things in perspective for the prostate cancer. Let's look at what is happening in the prostate cancer. In the next two slides, I will try to sum it up that that has been my understanding as to what is going on with the prostate cancer and how I came to basic understanding of this cancer and how to manage it. So you have to understand when a molecular biologist look, looks at a cancer, they look at different pathways. And these different pathways are the AKA signaling. There is an, a hedgehog pathway. There is a death receptor like an F-kappa B. There is a Warburg effect and all those things. So I had to put things in perspective for a prostate cancer. And things which started emerging was that there is a proliferation of the cancer because there is an AKT pathway 
which has a tumor suppressor known as P10, is in more active, causing more proliferation. Then the RAS is in another system which is also known as an oncogene addiction which overcomes the growth suppression. Then there is a Warburg effect based on the cellular energetics as I have talked about before. Then normal cells are told to die if they are not behaving okay and that is known as apoptosis. Then there is an anti-apoptotic pathway also which is happening. Cells learn never to age and that is an IGF-1 pathway. There is an inflammatory response through the TGF beta and the cytokines are involved. That is also working through an NF-kappa B pathway inside the nucleus. And then ultimately there is an immune uh, evasion to the tall receptors. There is an angiogenesis through VGF and EGF and there is tumor invasion through the CYP1 and NK4 pathways which causes finally the metastasis. This all happens through the genomic alterations which are happening inside the cell and in prostate cancer patients. And then in prostate cancer there is an involvement of the androgen receptor which can mediate through the different different pathways and impact almost all the pathways which are involved in the prostate cancer. So what we learned was from a normal cell to a high grade prosthetic intraepithelial neoplasia which is in kind of a precursor lesion there are certain injuries happening, certain exposures happening, certain dietary changes happening, inflammation happening, cell is going through a normal stress and strain, injury happening, regeneration happening, but there are certain changes like the GSTPI1 is getting damaged in, in high grade pens, there is a uh, MIC expression which is seen to be overactivated in a high grade pen, then there is an indolent cancer then there is an aggressive cancer and there is an inflammatory, a very invasive cancer. And as you can see, P10, PI3 kinase, FLIP, P53, these are the different genes which have been involved. Inflammation is a mediator and different other markers, they become active, which actually impact invasive properties, what we call epithelial to mesenchymal transformation. This is the process of learning about the prostate cancer from a genetic standpoint and that gave me a better understanding as a surgeon scientist to embark upon a journey that now when I do prostate cancer biopsies I try to look for genes which tell me more than what the biopsy shows. I can choose patients for active surveillance or surgery based on their genomic profile. When a patient has had a surgery and they have a more aggressive cancer uh, we are working on a protocol in which we are trying to develop a vaccine based on their own genomic signature and if patient's cancer comes back we try to sequence them, we understand what is happening in them and then finally we will develop a more targeted drug therapy. Thank you very much. Hello Dr. Tawari. I want to thank you so much for your time today and I'm going to say thank you and I think we'll, we'll end this and wish everybody a good Friday evening in the United States and uh, thank you for joining us in India early on Saturday morning. Have a great weekend. Well, you're very welcome. And if anyone has a question, they can find my email and I'll be more than happy to answer that. Thank you very much. Have a great evening. Bye-bye.